Today, we are scaling up and testing the world's first fully 3D printed 10-inch subwoofer enclosure. How does it sound? How many decibels can it produce? And how well does the Creality CR10 version 2 handle this 300-hour torture test? Grab some headphones and let's dive in. So, right away, that is a giant box, and beneath the first layer of foam there is a 300 by 300 millimeter print bed. The base lifts out, thankfully untethered from the rest of the machine, and oh, hey, I found a screw. Anyhow, more stuff comes out. There is the brain box, followed by a giant gantry, which I'm just awkwardly gonna set down here and take this wide angle pan shot. As you can see, the packing list is reasonably light, better still, I just found where the screw goes. It appears to have escaped from the housing for the Y-axis tensioning pulley, presumably after this sticker had been applied. And the machine does show signs of having been test assembled. Anyhow, that's back in place, there is good tension on the belt, so let's move on to the underside, where you'll find the print bed carriage traveling back and forth on six rollers, several of which needed some adjusting. And while we're back here, notice how the heating element spans just about the entire underside of the platform. Then continue noticing as I attach the gantry. The machine also came with these support rods in a sense triangulating the structure for additional rigidity. At this point it was down to the wire, literally speaking. A couple of harnesses, the end stop trigger for the Z-axis, and a few braided cables between the printer and the brain box. Flip the power switch and… It's alive! It's also devoid of any bed leveling assistance. As it stands, you merely disable the steppers and physically maneuver the nozzle into a given position. Of course, that's not an issue if you've sprung for the BL touch sensor, which we'll come back to in a minute. For now, let's take a moment to reflect on the sheer scale of this thing. With a build volume of 300 by 300 by 400 millimeters, it is my largest printer to date. Fittingly, it comes equipped with dual steppers for the Z axis, an all metal extruder, and a ceramic coated glass build plate. The BL Touch Auto Leveling Sensor comes as an optional upgrade directly from Creality, and as you can see, the kit includes all the hardware you'll need to set it up. Though, first we'll want to flash the machine with a BL Touch version of the firmware. Afterwards, we no longer need the trigger on the Z axis, instead, the bed leveling sensor is attached to the carriage. And since I'll be running more wires along here anyway, may as well remove the Bowden tube and reattach it in a more upright stance. The socket for the BL touch harness is just behind this cover, and once the connection is made, all the cables can be zip tied back along the reattached Bowden tube, and the cover can be replaced. The printer is now BL touch ready. In fact, it tells you as much when you power it up. What this actually means is that whenever the machine levels itself, it relearns the shape of the build surface by physically probing it along 25 separate coordinates and compensating for any deviation in the distance between the nozzle and the build plate. Naturally, there's still a matter of adjusting the initial Z offset, though once that value is stored, the machine can essentially self-calibrate. And this can be called upon using the G29 command inserted directly after the normal homing operations in the G-code as I'll now demonstrate with a 3D Benchy. Here is the tail end of the leveling process after the print bed and hot end have already reached their target temperatures, and once it has acquired a complete snapshot of the build surface, the machine goes right to printing the model. What's more, if I whip out the macro lens, you can actually see an individual layer being formed. Check that out. Anyhow, this goes on for another hour or so, at the end of which there is a shiny blue, nearly flawless Benchy cooling on the platform. Though that's only the beginning, in fact, if you recall an earlier video featuring the dual 3-inch microsub, this is the machine that saved the day and now seems like the appropriate time to share that footage. As you can see here, the sheer span of the build surface allows for the model to be printed with a brim, further reducing the odds of warped edges. And if you fancy the filament, that is Shine Blue PLA from TTYT 3D, available sporadically, though I found that once I've added something to my Amazon storefront, links down below, you can still pull it up even if it's out of stock, so there's a way to keep tabs. Anyhow, once the print is finished, the removable build plate makes the next step a lot easier. Here, a flexible rounded edge prying tool should make all the difference, and as usual, my Raptor blade is up to the task, releasing the model without a scratch. This, however, is not the highlight of the video, in fact, let's get right to it. What you're looking at here is the 2200 series 10 inch subwoofer from Audio Dynamics, aka my day job, and today we're going to print a full scale enclosure to see how it copes with high sound pressure levels. So, here's what I've come up with. The main body of the enclosure will resemble a trapezoid that comes together in two parts, forming a down-firing wedge. 
The waveguide, also in two parts, is modeled with the cross-section expanding to help sustain laminar flow at high velocity. That goes in here, a terminal plate down here, and as a finishing touch, I also modeled these corner protectors, which I suppose could be printed out of polyurethane or some other elastic polymer, but for the purpose of this project, I am only interested in PLA. Performance-wise, the enclosure is designed to cover a bandwidth of 30 to 80 Hz along the headrest of my Chevy Sonic hatchback, with a peak around 48 Hz and an estimated 129 decibels at 600 watts of input power. Here, I say estimated as my large signal predictions don't account for power compression or the effects of structural compliance on what is quite literally a thermal plastic container. At any rate, let's get it made. Here's a bunch of black and silver PLA from Hatchbox, and here's the CR10 set up on the print rack. We'll go with a layer height of 0.2mm because I'm just that patient, 4 perimeters all the way around, and a hefty bit of infill. I'm also interested to see just how much of this build surface I can address. So I set an already giant model to print with a brim, effectively telling the machine to swing right up to the edge, and it does. The infill at 30% looks a lot more dense than my usual 20, though it'll also have a lot more to contend with both in terms of pressure and weight. In fact, at a Z height of 118 millimeters, some 3 days and 10 hours into the print, a kilogram of PLA had already been depleted. Changing out the spools couldn't be easier, and once the filament is fed through, the machine goes right back to what it was doing. A couple of days later, it is finally done. The last few lines of the G-code instruct the heating elements to power down, followed by a small retraction. The hotend lifts and travels home on the X and Y axis for the remainder of the cooldown. So, how long did the print take to finish? 5 days, 21 hours and 47 minutes. At this point, I like to ensure that all the steppers are disabled so that I can safely pull the bed forward, release the build plate and lift it out. Back at the bench now to get the print removed and once again it separates from the build plate without incident. The brim peels away quite easily and before long we have a decent looking half a box. With a density of 0.65 grams per cubic centimeter, it is actually pretty solid. For comparison, MDF comes in at around 0.74 grams and Birch Ply comes in at 0.54. As such, this chunk weighs in at nearly 4 pounds, however, it does exhibit some less than ideal damping properties. As you'll hear in a second, there is a structural mode around 226 Hz. Thankfully, this is well outside the range of the sub and should not affect the performance. The second half of the enclosure printed much like the first, and once I popped it off the plate, it was finally time to swap colors. Here's a spool of silver, and for the waveguide, I went with a solid infill, essentially giving it the consistency of an injection molded precision port. The remaining bits were printed solid as well. So, here at long last is the complete inventory of the 3D printed bits needed to assemble this project. As usual, I begin with binding posts, then Sophie does her thing with the JB Weld, and there is plenty of stuff to bond this time around. Both the waveguide and the corner pieces are meant to be replaceable, so they're held in with these M3 screws and maybe some blue tack for a better seal around the vent, however, as I don't anticipate having to pull this back apart, I've gone with a more permanent solution. Once all the epoxy has gotten a chance to cure, the sub is wired in parallel, and while it does come with a rubber gasket, I don't know how well it will seal against the fine washboard-like surface of a 3D print. In fact, this is one of the main reasons I prefer smaller nozzles and a fine layer height. In any case, I decided to lay some blue tag down before mounting the sub. And here it is, taking center stage in this 23.94 liter enclosure. At this point, we can move the party out to the car, where the rear view is already kinda shaky. What's in the trunk, Pete? Nothing! Actually, I've been running this dual 3-inch print as my daily driver and it does alright, but now it's time to swap it up for something more imposing. So, right away, let's get a frequency response measurement, and I've set that up at the headrest since that is also where I modeled the predicted response. And there it is. Of course I'm glad to see the enclosure performing nearly as it should, though to demonstrate this in no uncertain terms I've also prepared a bit of a test track. It's been playing throughout the background, but if you'll entertain a brief solo, coming up is a bass heavy rendition played at volume and recorded on a pair of the C2 microphones in the passenger seat. Enjoy!
Now then, with this being my first conventional scale cardio subwoofer enclosure made entirely on a 3D printer, I can already sense the comments asking for some decibel figures. So, given that my SPL predictions already placed this setup in the upper 120s and the Omni mic caps out at 130, this is where I switched to the Termlab. If you're keeping tabs, the sub is being powered with an Audio Dynamics MK600.1 Class D monoblock, delivering upwards of 600 watts from a stock electrical system in this equally stock 2015 Chevy Sonic hatchback. Some initial testing revealed 47 Hz as the dominant cabin resonance, and the enclosure sitting in this orientation as the most efficient at that frequency. So, without any further ado, let's generate some pressure. 47 cycles. And there it is, 139 decibels at the dash. Not terribly impressive on one hand, but on the other, I have not been able to find any account of a fully 3D printed enclosure posting a higher score, so in some unofficial capacity this could very well be the record, though hopefully not for long. Anyway, let's wrap this up with some final words about the machine, and I have to say that I am very impressed. Evidently my reviews have become popular among those looking to exploit the very limits of a printer's build volume, and in that regard the CR10 version 2 from Creality receives my full endorsement. This project alone has given the machine 300 plus hours during which any number of things could have gone wrong, yet nothing has. Not a single corner lifted, not a single filament jam, not a single layer shift, in fact, the only negatives that I could think to mention are annoyances at best. Right away, the BL Touch should come as a standard pre-installed feature, there's no good reason for a build plate this large to rely on manual bed leveling. And second, the brain box tends to slide around, so maybe these metal nubbins could be replaced with some rubber feet. That aside, the print quality is easily on par with my Prusa Mark III S, and the build volume is large enough to complete every model I've released to date. Speaking of which, I just posted this one to Thingiverse, so if you have the build volume and the patience, also a 2200 series 10 from Audio Dynamics, you can experience everything you've seen here for yourself. Likewise, you can share this project with your own cardio community and hopefully inspire some creative use of 3D printing. For all intents and purposes, this video shows that it's certainly possible and effective, however impractical it may be for the time being, though that's how most things begin. I'm also looking forward to your comments. What speakers or headphones are you listening on? What do you think about this long-form presentation style? What is your next big hobby-related purchase? As always, I thank you for watching, don't forget to rate this video as you see fit, Join me on Patreon, where the next Q&A segment could possibly take the form of a podcast. Subscribe if you haven't already, there's always new stuff on the way, and I'll see you in the next one. Cheers!